All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of our MAG Meet the Specialist sessions. We're finding that these are going down really well with people. It's a little snapshot where you get to actually meet the person who's doing the assessment for your client and see them as the wonderful real people they are. Today, we are joined with the very lovely Dr. Ka Heng Lee, who has recently joined our expert panel. He is a specialist occupational and environmental physician, and he has worked in the field for about 10 years. Uh, he's worked with a number of, of very interesting clients across diverse types of workforces. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. And he has been doing fitness for work and independent medical examinations for some years. We hope to build up his practice with us at MAG. And in a couple of years, he will obtain his uh, Victoria WorkSafe accreditation as well and be able to take on those matters. Um, Dr. Lee writes a really good report. Um, so I know you'll be very pleased with his work and we look forward to booking with him for you. So without further ado, I will hand over to the lovely Dr. Ka Heng Lee to introduce himself and have a bit of a chat with you. Thanks, Michelle. I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us today and giving me your time. Uh, makes me feel really important now. Uh, I'm not that great at talking myself up, so I've prepared a few slides beforehand that I'll share with you just to prompt myself as we go along. Okay. All right, can everyone see that okay? All right, so just to clarify, this lady over here is obviously not myself. Um, I'm not sure who that is, just uh, some branding material from MAG. So again, my name is Ka Heng Lee. I am an occupational and environmental physician. Now, one of the questions that I automatically get when I introduce myself as such is, what is occupational and environmental medicine? So I won't go too deeply into it, just a brief overview. The occupational side of things, uh, in layman's terms, is pretty much considering the effect of work on health and the effect of health on work. And in that first instance, you might think of a scenario where, for example, a welder is walking along, trips and sprains his ankle. That's how his work has affected his health. And an example of the second scenario would be, uh, for example, a train driver who's had a recent heart attack. And there's a question raised of whether they can go back to work as a train driver or not. So th those two main categories sort of encompass the practice of occupational medicine. Now, environmental medicine is a niche. It's in fact a niche within a niche, right? And it probably will not be the type of work that you approach my uh, practitioners like myself on. So it, it has to do with the health impacts of industry on the environment. And uh, one famous example in the past few years was the government hiring an occupational environmental physician to study the health effects of uh, wind turbines, of, of windmills, uh, power generation through windmills on the surrounding populace. And of course there was none, but that's an example of environmental medicine. Now, I like to think that our field is very holistic in the view of workers and work. So we won't look at a worker and, and go, I am looking only at this one sprained finger and I'll, I won't comment on anything else and I won't take anything else into account. Right? I can't speak for other practitioners, but typically if I notice that there's pain behavior, that someone is, in, that there's inconsistencies in how they're presenting, that they're clearly very distressed and they need psychological support uh, even though what they've presented for was a, was a finger injury, I will comment on those things and I'll take it into account a little bit, right? Just within the scope of my practice. We also think in very positive terms. And one example of that is the official statement by the Australia's in Faculty of Occupational and Environmental Medicine called the Health Benefits of Good Work, where they've collated all the evidence and release this statement saying, we think that as long as the work is good, so it's not like abnormally dangerous, abnormally unhealthy, that being at work is good for people. So we think in those terms. So when we assess people, there's a very strong focus on what an individual can do. And so if you're uh, 
a work of insurer, for example, you're, you're trying to examine how people could potentially go back to work or change vocations and perform alternative duties. We think very strongly in those terms. And conversely, if you're, for example, a, a plaintiff lawyer, if we conclude that someone can't work, you can be fairly assured we've tried it from all angles. We've thought about what they can do. And if we say they can't work, you've got a pretty airtight case. It's pretty safe to say that they really can't. Okay. Right, so just quickly, my qualifications, uh, I'm sure everyone's seen all the fancy letters after someone's name and perhaps pondered what they are. This is a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. This is a Bachelor of Medical Science Honours. This means Graduate Diploma in Occupational and Environmental Medicine. And this one's a real mouthful. This is a Fellow of the Australasian Faculty of Occupational and Environmental Medicine which is a faculty of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Uh, what does this all mean? It just means that I'm a fully qualified specialist. I've got all the necessary postgraduate training and that I'm part of uh, an accredited college. So sometimes there are colleges that aren't actually accredited. This one is an accredited college. I've worked in full-time occupational medicine since 2012. And these are some of the crown jewels of my career. I have had many industry positions and that is pretty rare. So they are very, it's very competitive to get a, an industry position these days. They're hard to come by. And I'm a company doctor for ExxonMobil or ESSO. I'm sure everyone's heard of that one. I'm company doctor for Quenos, uh, who make most of Australia's plastic. So your recycling bins, your milk bottles, things like that. Chances are the plastic has come from Quenos. I was company doctor for Dow Chemical right up until they shut down their plant in Altona. I have been a doctor who oversighted Pfizer's uh, health surveillance, so their blood test results. And I'm currently speaking with an international heavy vehicle man uh, manufacturer uh, about becoming their chief medical officer. But there's no contract yet, so it's all very hush hush. I'm not allowed to say who they are. My scope of practice in the past has involved a lot of frontline occupational medicine clinic work. So things like injury management, rehabilitation, return to work. So if you're an employer and you know a worker has gotten injured, you might have sent a worker to an occupational medicine clinic. So I did that type of work for a very long time. I also do still do health surveillance and I oversight the work of other doctors. So if someone has gone for a silica medical examination to make sure that they're not getting any health problems from that, sometimes I'm the doctor who oversees that the other doctor has done the right thing. I've been involved in all sorts of fields in, in the span of my career. I have had exposure to manufacturing, mining, healthcare, warehousing, pharmaceuticals, transportation. You can see the, the entire list here, and this is not extensive. Pretty much if you name it, I've probably been involved in it in some way. I'm the current chair of the Australasian Faculty of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, Victoria and Tasmania Regional Committee. So I organize the educational activities for the other doctors in my specialty for these two states. And I've also been a training supervisor, so I train new doctors in my specialty and a Monash University tutor, so I teach medical students medicine. Now, my medical legal practice has involved multiple types of assessments. I've done fitness for duty work. I've done insurance determination work. I've done plaintiff and defendant work, and I've done medical negligence work. And some features of my personal practice, I type my reports at the time of the consultation and I upload the reports the same day. I don't keep separate notes. I don't write up the report a few weeks later. Uh, I have never failed to upload a report on the same day. Now, that's not a guarantee that you will get a report on the same day because that's just my personal practice. Reports do still have to go through administrative teams for quality assurance and that sort of thing. But you can rest assured that the holdup is never on my end. The whole, If there's a holdup, it's never because I just didn't do the report. I just didn't upload the report. Now, not keeping separate notes means you, there's never a possibility of discrepancy. You're never going to get a report and then ask for the doctor's notes and then find that, whoops, the notes actually say something other than what the report says. 
And now there's some conundrum to work through. That will never happen. And I don't do any handwriting. It's all typed on the spot. So you never have to st stare at a doctor's handwriting and go, what in the world did this person write? OK, so some quick highlights of my medical legal practice, just uh, current things that I'm proud of. Uh, recently, I assessed an examinee for quote unquote a back condition. And this person had been seeing their GP for many, many years. They had an independent assessment with an orthopedic surgeon and an independent assessment with another occupational physician. And all of the other practitioners had missed that this person didn't have a back problem. They actually had a hip problem. So finally, I saw them. I diagnosed what the actual condition was, and she was on track for appropriate uh, treatment. So I, I really made a big difference in the claim and this person's quality of life, and I'm very proud of that. Another case was where I assisted an examinee who had actually been seen by a different independent examiner only a few months prior. So that had me scratching my head going, hang on, why is the same client asking for another independent assessment so soon? And I figured out that the person's physical issue was really secondary and what they really needed was psychiatric and psychological support and assessment. And the problem had been that the previous examiner had sort of talked around the subject without really confronting it. And they just totally dodged the problem. So when I spoke to the client, they, they heaved a huge sigh of relief and were like, thank you. We all could see that there was this problem and none of us could say anything because we're not doctors and they hadn't gotten what they needed from the other examination. But, you know, I managed to nail down the problem and this person hopefully got the help that they needed. Recently, I've also attracted the attention of a federal client in a good way. I'm not in trouble with the law or anything like that. Uh, and it's because they have given feedback that I write very balanced reports. And I'm sure a lot of you understand why that's important, uh, especially when dealing with opposition. So the federal client has very strong worker unions. And if you write a really biased report, it can be picked apart easily by the union, by their lawyers and things like that. That's no good to anyone, right? It, it doesn't help the client at the end of the day if the report is weak because you've been biased. So they like my work a lot and they these days book up to half of my availability. So that's about it. I don't want to drag on for too long. So thank you very much. And do you guys have any questions? Thank you, Dr. Lee. That was really, really informative about the practice of occupational physician work and also about how you uh, run your practice. Um, does anyone have a question that they would like to ask? If you can just uh, un unmute yourself and speak up. No. Now, when this happens, Dr. Lee, it's usually because the presentation was so good. Ooh, we've got some. Oh. Good. I've got one. Thank you, Dr. Lee. That was a really helpful um, presentation. I, um, um, I'm a plaintiff lawyer, so that's my angle of today and, and looking at how our occupational physician uh, reports can help our clients. And I guess I would like your insights in uh, what is a good brief in the sort of records you would like to get um, and in the detail in there that needs to be there because clinical notes can vary in detail as you Absolutely. can imagine and doctor reports can also um, comment on the question which is usually for my clients total and permanent disability yep. um, but not fully identify things like functional restrictions and hmm. other limitations so I would just love if you could give us an ideal brief outline yeah, yeah. oh I, I could talk for hours about that but I won't <laughs> I won't uh, now I think what is a really good referral is a referral letter that contains the scope of what has happened to the person in brief detail like if you're sending a person because they fell and broke their knee and now they can't walk and you're wondering what sort of work they can do or whether they're totally permanently disabled saying that in a few sentences is very helpful Sometimes I get referrals from plaintiff lawyers that don't contain any background information at all. And then it's just, just straight to the list of questions. 
uh, having a list of questions is also important. I've also unfortunately refer received referrals where it's, can you please write a report about this person? And I'm like, okay, but what do you but what do you want to know, right? And what happened to this person? So those are very important, uh, believe it or not, even though they're so basic. I think that documentation is very not more is better. It, it really doesn't work like that. If you send 3,000 pages of past history, often only like 10, 20, 50 pages of it is really useful. I have received things like pay slips, uh, tax returns, mm. childhood GP history spanning all the way until they were a toddler and none of it was, was useful. What is useful is typically investigation results because those are very objective. Uh, spe recent specialist letters specifically in reference to the condition at hand. And if there's any information from the GP, typically only with regards to what the actual injury or matter is. So don't send us the cough colds thing. And maybe lawyers aren't aware of this, but when you put the question to the GP to release information to you, you can say to them, we're only interested in any records you have in relation to this injury. Don't send us the cough cold stuff. And they won't. So I think those are the, the main pillars of a referral is tell us why you're referring them, have a specific list of questions and make sure that the documentation is actually relevant. Mm -hmm. Great, Beautiful. thank you. One of the other things I just wanted to interject, and it's a question that my team and I get asked all the time in relation to um, certain injuries and getting an assessment done. Now, the injury that the person has, and, and most commonly it will be orthopedic, um, so they've they've had a fall, they've had a break, they've had a crush, whatever it is, and they've had a number of procedures, surgical and otherwise, to repair or rectify it to the best possible. And they'll say, I'd like an orthopedic surgeon to review this. Uh, but but more and more when we see reports like Dr. Lee's, we would urge people to consider having an occupational physician do that review because an orthopedic surgeon can look at the injury and the surgery that's been done to repair it and comment on the efficacy of that procedure. But they don't comment holistically about the person like an occupational physician does. They're concerned about, did was this surgery performed to the textbook standard and, and has the injury been resolved? Whereas the occupational physician is concerned with what is this person's functional capacity moving forward? What are their limitations? And possibly what kind of modifications are they going to have to make in their life, including future surgeries? So there really is an absolute goldmine to be had from an, and, and I don't mean that in terms of money, I mean that in terms of outcomes for the injured person by having this more holistic assessment done. That's just my interjection there. I've actually got one more question. Sorry. Um, are there any injuries that uh, you feel are not appropriate for an occupational physician assessment? Like, for example, um, a uh, someone with significantly reduced vision due to losing uh, an eye. Um, is that something that, I mean, there's going to be functional limitations in their capacity, but is that something that you would provide an report on or is there any other guidance you can give on other sorts of injuries yes. so you... like someone having an injured eye and therefore you know reduced vision that's absolutely something an occupational physician can assess and comment on that's not a problem now i will say that people's comfort in their scope of practice does vary so i can't speak for every other occupational physician i can only speak for you know what i'm comfortable to do mm -hmm. I'm pretty much comfortable with any type of physical injury. Um, with psychiatric and psychological things, I will only comment if I feel that I can, right? And that's typically when it's very clear cut, when there's laws around it, uh, it's like a legislative industry, like transportation, uh, commercial driving, uh, train driving, all those have laws written around it. So we can comment because, you know, for example, if someone has severe depression and they're feeling suicidal and the question is can this person work as a train driver i'm comfortable saying that they can't when it gets to something that is not legislated and more subtle so let's say for an, for example 
uh, an executive who is feeling anxious lately and their concentration has been slipping, can they still perform high level executive? That is very subtle. You need possibly a neuropsychological assessment, possibly a psychiatrist ass assessment, possibly psychology. Uh, it is not clear cut, right? So I wouldn't do the latter. The former, pretty easy to do, right? Safe, safety critical things, severe, severe mental health issues, uh, confirmed diagnosis. I can do those things. Uh, another category which I sometimes struggle a little bit with are those conditions that have very poor sort of evidence around them. Things like multiple ke uh, chemical sensitivity syndrome. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. It's where someone claims that they sniffed a chemical once and now they can't stand any chemical ever, and, you know. Uh, they can't be around house cleaning agents, they can't be around fertilizers, they can't be around soap. They, the problem with those conditions is there's no real evidence that they exist and you can't test them, you can't prove them. So I struggle with those a little bit because they are probably more appropriate for psychiatry or psychology. Okay. Besides that, if it's physical, I'm mostly comfortable doing it. And if you send a referral and I read it, and I go, oh, this is not something I can deal with. I'm happy to give you a call and explain why and say, look, best you research or someone else. Lovely. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, if there's um, no more further questions, we can wrap this up now because these ones, oh, we do have a question. Lovely. Go ahead. We can't hear you. You're on mute. Hmm. I, I wonder if they're actually maybe talking to someone else rather than us. Could oh, be. There, there we, we go. go. Try it. Try now. I'm terribly sorry. We, we cannot hear you at all. Would you be able to type your question into the chat at the bottom? All right. Look in the chat. Will you arrange, would you arrange a workplace assessment prior to a physical assessment? Uh, I can. I don't insist on it or anything like that. Uh, workplace assessments are very common practice for occupational physicians, and they're certainly lots of work cover accredited, accredited type work where they will organize that. So if you want me to, just let me know and I'd be happy to do it. If for some reason I've assessed someone and I feel that I can't answer certain questions without doing the workplace assessment, I will raise that in the report. But it, it's rarely absolutely necessary prior to every assessment, you know, if, if that's the question. Lovely. Any more questions? No. Thank you all so very much for making time to meet our wonderful specialist, Dr. Ka Heng Lee. And thank you, Dr. Lee, for your time today. That was terrific. Everybody thank you go very and much have for, a all of you for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Magic. Take have care. a great rest of the day. You too. See you.